Welcome to The Bright Side of Longevity. Join Dr. Roger Landry and guests as they discuss the bright side of getting older through healthy longevity. Guided by research, this lighthearted and educational discussion will leave you with practical tips and ways to impact your lifestyle to brighten life's journey. Well, welcome everybody to the bright side of longevity. I'm here with my ever ready friend, colleague, and uh, teacher to me, Danielle. How are you, Danielle? Hey, Dr. Roger. Happy almost Valentine's Day. Ah, uh, yes. That's coming. Kind of the big heart month. Yeah. Well, I think that's a lead into what we want to talk about. Uh, actually, for the next two times we get together is uh we're going to begin a two-part series today right and that's about fear well, what was that got to do with valentine's day huh but the title is uh, overcoming fear and moving toward love and compassion and you know i think um i before you tune out anybody who's not in a relationship or you know don't even doesn't even like to say the word love or whatever mm -hmm. or have been jolted by love or don't have a good opinion of love whatever don't go away right they should stay with us. It's going to be very encouraging, no matter whether you're single in a relationship, because this is about all relationships and just having more loving, compassionate relationships. Absolutely. So fear, uh, we're going to start with fear, oddly enough, and we're going to drill down on that because, uh, yeah, per perhaps someone could say it's the opposite of love. I think after these this two-part series, you will say that. You will understand that. Fear uh, and love are very much connected. We're going to dig down deeply into uh, even our species history and why we are who we are, what is love to us, what is fear to us. And we're going to start, because I think we should, by exploring fear. So stay with us, okay? Trust us. We're going to get to love for sure, but we're going to get to love in a way that I think is going to be much more understandable and probably, I hope, we both hope, most very much more achievable and broader than you may be thinking now. So fear. So I think there's a lot of fear in the world, don't you, Danielle? How is it manifested in you think? Oh, my gosh. It shows up in so many ways. It shows up whenever we have feeling defensive. If somebody has a different opinion than us, it shows up as anxiety, as regret. It can even show up as loneliness, a fear of abandonment. When we're judging other people, that's a kind of fear because it's it's ego driven. They feel differently than us. What's wrong with us? Fear shows up as failure. I just uh, looked at the top 10 uh, fears and failures right at the top. You're absolutely right. And the others that you mentioned, loss, loss of identity or control and being judged and and violence is a manifestation of fear, oddly enough. And of course, violence in the world causes fear also. So it's a world, uh, I think, that's filled with fear. Uh, it may not be labeled fear immediately because we're talking not just about the shaking chills when someone's about to hit you with a club. You know, it's about the underlying fear that, uh, that we all experience. Um, it is uh, the uncertainty and uh, the, the, uh, the anxiety is probably a great word because that's sort of an unfocused discomfort. You know, you don't have something specific that you're fearful of, but you're fearful. You know, you're uncertain. It's a plague, isn't it? Yeah. And it's so fascinating to me how it manifests in so many different ways. So if we fail or, or feel like we're wrong about something, it triggers that stress response as if you're fearing for your life and you have to defend yourself. Because when you drill down, it's almost as you fear you'll lose your job. What will that mean? Okay, I can't support my family. What does that mean? That means starvation. Oh, so if you drill it down, it gets down to I fear for my survival in a in yes. a very strange way that's kind of in our DNA. Yeah, in just a minute, I think we'll go down, we'll drill down to our ancestors the way I always do. You know, everybody's going to roll their eyes. There he goes again. You know, our species at the beginning. 
but there are there are some more uh not so distant things that cause us to be fearful maybe what our lives have been like our experiences absolutely you know as children we're born fearless <laughs> and yes. and yet we're taught and when you're growing up were you told that the world was a loving place or a place to be feared for example did you live in a household where there was a scarcity mindset where you heard your parents saying, we could be homeless. So I don't know how we're going to put food on the table. Did you come from a family that was a verbally abusive or very loving? That's going to change how you view the world. And this one is so intriguing. What were you told about yourself as a child? For example, were you told, oh, you're just too sensitive or you're a natural born leader? Those things impact us. And even at a young age, we start to look for evidence of that in the world. Absolutely. And uh, we may have had experiences in relationships that turned out really poorly. And then we fear connection. And that is that is a very difficult fear, as you you're going to learn how it is so as fear and love are related. And uh, and then, you know, just uh, something terrible that has happened to you, bankruptcy or or an attack or some violence on you or even a, a traumatic experience with PSD, you know, and and uh, and and uh, that can drive our personal fear and uh, which um, which I think really limits us in uh, in our ability to do the thing that can ameliorate that fear, get rid of it. And but we'll, we'll talk more about that. But, uh, you know, at, you know, you've already alluded to uh, what is your relationship history, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, that those things alone can drive fear of relationships as, as we've alluded to. And, and so there's, there's more though. There's, there's who we, we've, you've heard us talk about mindset and, uh, that's what you're alluding to, aren't you, Danielle, when you talk about how you look at the world, right? Yeah. So you carry that. You look for evidence to support good or bad. And as adults, you know, I would ask people, how do you see yourself in the world? What are your beliefs about who you are and your place in the world? Is it one where you feel the world is out to get you? Or do you feel a deep sense of connection with the community around you? Uh, how do you handle rejection? and failure. When do you decide, hey, I'm going to change strategy or I'm just going to give up? Or when do we go to those absolute thoughts like I must or they should and we we create rules for ourselves and others based on what we've learned about how the world is. And every time it comes from a negative place, I would offer that it's coming from that fear, that place of fear. As the sages would say, are you going to live in love or fear? And I, I think that that uh, they're onto something because every negative thought can be reduced to some fear. I believe that also. You know, we, we've been talking about uh, how much loneliness is in the world today. Some some countries are even have established a ministry of loneliness. And with loneliness comes fear because if we travel through this world, uh, feeling alone uh, or and at any relationship we had is sort of superficial and peripheral. And uh, the only person we can really depend on in the end is ourselves. That is a horrible place to be. And, and it causes such anxiety and fear. Uh, that's, and I, and I believe that that's the majority of people today to some, at some level feel, um, that no matter what, it's a it's a doggy dog world, or that at least uh, uh, if you, if you're going to make something good happen in your life, it, it's only going to come from you, and you're alone. That sort of thing. I think a lot of that was some kind of societal concept where you're mentioning the dog eat dog world, where at one time therapists would throw around the words codependency, and I wish that they would replace that word with interdependent. Because the truth is, we do need people to say, I don't need anyone, I can do it myself. Not only is that not true, but it puts you in conflict with other people. It just further divides people. You know, I think this is a good opportunity for me to get out the drill now. And uh, let's look at this from an evolutionary uh, viewpoint. 
because uh, I believe it's fitting. And a lot of what we just described, I believe, is fairly new with our species. I mean, in the big picture of things. Uh, a lot of it has changed uh, since, you know, you've heard 99% of the time we've been on Earth, we were hunter gatherers in small tribes and we we depended on each other for survival. And, uh, I, you know, everyone had a role. We've, we've heard all of that. But, you know, over the last few centuries, especially since the Industrial Revolution, a lot has changed and, and has brought a lot of what we just described as manifestations of fear. But let's look back to those hunter gatherer. Uh, times we from that and be, because we live that way for so long we are a absolutely we are social creatures and uh, this is not just a word this is something where it, it is it is our air it is our nutrition it is relationships and connection are absolutely essential uh, i believe personally that Yes, I think our ancestors had fear when they were attacked by something or maybe a storm was coming. But there was such cohesion, which came from the need to survive, that I believe there was less fear. The fear when, you know, it's a fight or flight, it was a survival instinct. But fear from just daily life, I believe, was not as prevalent because we were a tight-knit group that were, we had connections that we felt were were substantive, were meaningful. Sure, there were bad feelings, annoyings. We're humans, that happens. But I believe in the end, we all knew that we could, uh, that our ancestors could depend because it's necessary. We see this today in, say, combat groups where people may not even like each other, but they'll do anything for the other person. It's a, it's a, it's so and we see that in groups. And so that's who we are as humans. And so fear... For that group, and I believe still is inherent in us, came from the possibility of being alone. So what did tribes do when something did so someone did something terrible? Or even later on when there were towns and cities, they exiled them. And they were, and that's the worst punishment that they could think of short of death, but it's probably worse than death in many instances. And and probably resulted in death. I was going to say, and they're on yeah. on their own. They're not going to get too far, most likely. Yeah. yeah, the world was a tough neighborhood for our hunter gatherer ancestors, you know, and uh, and so that's who we are as humans because for most of the time we've been on Earth, that's how we live in tight knit, very connected groups where no matter what we could depend upon the other person. Now. We don't necessarily have to call that love, but we can call it the absence of fear or at least the minimization uh, of fear. And so the fear that we experience today, I don't believe was as prevalent or even existing for our ancestors. And that's why I think we are so bothered with it, but it all comes with our, how we're living our lives. That's deep. I know you want to... <laughs> You want to time in and say that what the doctor really meant to say. Well, I can do that. And basically the, the message is find your tribe. Now, what's interesting about what you said is they were small, tight knit groups. So having thousands of people on social media is not your tribe. In fact, if anything, that causes sometimes causes more fear and anxiety because you've got all that, those negative things coming in the emotional highs and lows. And I'm not saying social media is bad. I use it as well. But when we say find your tribe, we're talking a small group. You determine how many people that that is, whether that's three, five, a dozen. But that's your group that you know if you need somebody, you can call them in the middle of the night and they will be there for you. Can jump back for a minute uh, and and talk about how we're living today. And uh, w w you know, we have talked about cognitive behavior theory, how we are. And well, we can talk about it as chattering mind, the way Buddhists do it. And and when you talk about meditation and mindfulness, which we will be talking about. And uh, you've uh, Teresa shared this statistic on one of our uh, previous earlier podcasts about how we have from 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day, right? 
And, and what kind of thoughts are they, Danielle? You remember negative and 80% re- repetitive. <laughs> and for those who are just tuning in, uh, Teresa Beshwaite is the sudden widow coach. She has been both a co host and a guest on our show, and she does some really fabulous work out there. So, all these negative thoughts going around in our head, you know, and we know they're a loop. You know, they're repeating, they're repetitive, and they're and mostly negative. That's just who we are. And uh, and so that can drive fear just within our mind, right? And uh, and so it, how do, you know, that's going to, we have to address that when we talk about solutions. Uh, and so we've talked about mindset and our personal experience, but now we're talking about who we are as humans in this modern world. And how different that is from how we were in in previous times, and yet are, is still in us as a need to be connected with others that minimizes fear. And we're going to see that is the basis for love. I think our ancestors were connected not only to each other, but to nature, the world around them. And and I think you know we've we've now know that uh, that that's real the connection. You just told me about some uh, DNA studies that you had read about. Daniel. Yes, what something like um, our pets, our dogs and our cats, we have eighty to ninety percent shared DNA with dogs and cats, over ninety eight percent with pigs. with trees, 25% with flowers. Like there are, there's so much of our DNA in all the life that is around us. And I found that completely fascinating. It is. And, and, you know, we talk about primates, you know, we want to, you want to say how much of that we share with primates. It's freak you out. But, you know, we're a planet and we're composed of carbon and nitrogen and, and, and all those elements and all of us are, all living things are, and even the inanimate things are, are composed of some of those. I've told you the story of my friend who was an astronaut. When he looked down on the earth, he said it changed him forever because all of a sudden he had a, a view of us as uh, this little ball in a big universe and, you know, little humans running around and dogs and cats and trees and, and how connected it all was. It, it really did change his life forever. Yeah, and it's good that you're bringing up that that spiritual component. Now, for some people, that might be religion. And and one of the things that when I talk about fear with clients, I'll ask them what their belief is. And you don't have to necessarily believe in religion. So if you do, call upon whatever that source is that's going to give you comfort. But you can also find that, as you mentioned, in nature. You can also find that among the people that you love. So maybe somebody that you love has passed, but they gave you a gift, whether it's a necklace, a scarf, a something. You can actually just wear that to feel as if that person's energy is there. And that can give you a sense of connection. Or going out in nature, we talked about forest bathing in other episodes to get that sense of connection. Excellent. That This is the beginning of what do we do about all this fear and anxiety that we have today that is interfering with our love relationships. And that's the first one. You know, I'm, I'm a little timid to jump into this with you because you are such a guru. But mindfulness, you know, it seems like so many of our podcasts, the majority, in fact, in one way or another, as we talk about healthy longevity or a quality life or purposeful life, mindfulness comes up. And it's related to what we just talked about, this uh, our, our chattering minds, and that we're so rarely present. And mindfulness is about being present. And when you're present, you, you shut down that negative loop, that 60,000 thoughts that are mostly negative and repetitive. And, and, and that's all it is. It's not magical. It's just that we're there living in the moment. And that's the only place we can truly live our lives. But being there Wow, it's it's kind of a beautiful experience when when you do get true presence and mindfulness. Yeah. And and there's three really good ways to overcome fear using a mindful approach. And the one you just mentioned, just giving yourself a chance to pause and quiet the chatter. And then the second one is even recognizing 
Are you coming from a place of fear of negativity or are you coming from a place of love and compassion? And sometimes you feel that emotionally, but sometimes you feel that physically and you don't know till you stop and you ask, how am I feeling in my body at this moment? And you realize, oh, my neck is a little tense or, and those are cues so that when you're having a conversation with somebody and you start to feel that tension in your neck, you're like, oh, I'm having a fear response and learning to identify it. Exactly. And, yeah. And the last one is just challenging yourself to change the direction. Um, if you find yourself going down the negative path, how can you turn turn it around to one of compassion or kindness or trust? Sometimes these are hard if somebody's being really nasty to you to be able to flip the switch and say, they're having a bad day. They're going through a rough time. So I am just going to not let it get to me and treat them with compassion because they're hurting. That's That's hard to do, but it can really help you move out of that fear-based living. Yeah, the rewards are great, you're telling me. It is hard to do, but the rewards are fantastic. And not you know, not only the way you feel, but the way you go through your life and your health, because we know that these negative attitudes and fear negatively affect our health. Uh, and all the all the big players, you know, heart disease, dementia, cancer are all much more common in people who are fearful who are not connected once again in particular and who are negative and uh, so another one is uh, should be you know if, if most of our thoughts are negative we have the ability to control those thoughts by focusing on positive things like basically having gratitude yes uh, you know and when we focus on when we think about gratitude you know even during covid many of us said okay some good has come from this a lot of bad and you can focus on that, but if you focus on the positive and you're grateful for that, that's a special moment. And that just wipes out fear for as long as you can focus on it. So we know that giving and receiving gratitude causes an increase in oxytocin, in dopamine, in serotonin in our brains, creating the feeling of happiness. One of my favorite quotes is not directly related to gratitude, but I still love it. Uh, Donald Hebb, the, he's a neuroscientist, and he says neurons that fire together wire together. And he was talking about how we learn. But if you think about it in terms of connection, how we, when we wire together, we're hardwired to be together and gratitude is a connector. It's a shared positive experience. And gratitude expert, Dr. Robert Emmons, I uh, mention him frequently because he really takes a deep dive into gratitude because it's more than just, I am grateful for. It's the frequency, how often are we expressing gratitude? The intensity, how strong is that gratitude? The span, how varied, how many different things are you grateful for? And the density, how deep is that gratitude? And the more we work on making it more expansive and we not only express gratitude, we write it down, we read it and we re-experience it and we share it with others. Every time we have those thoughts, our brain thinks it's happening for the first time. It's that uh, the miracle cure, so to speak, in many ways, uh, along with the other things we talked about. And for those who haven't heard about it, but, you know, she, Danielle mentioned oxytocin. That, that is the feel good hormone. That's uh, what mothers feel when they're breastfeeding. That's what we feel for those of us who like hugs. And most of us do. Some of us have been raised to be fearful and that sort of thing. But most of us love hugs and and the feeling you get. I think someone said it had to be a bit prolonged, like more than five seconds or something like I that. I think 10 but, seconds is the current rule. Yeah. And to, to really get that blast of oxytocin, which makes you feel like everything is right in the world. And uh, so that's uh, those are those are great solutions. Uh, again, not easy, but I think when you have something that gives you a positive incentive, in other words, a, re a great reward for the investment you make, well worth it.
So let's see where, where we've been today. We uh, we've explored the connection between fear and love and with our goal of uh, in the end in this two part series of having someone understand love more. Also fear, but mostly it's love and where it comes from. And we've explored how connection was our history in humans and connection, in fact, is what we seek regularly. That doesn't mean we have to always be with people, because like we said, we can be connected to nature. And so our, our world is filled with negativity, and which drives fear, which comes in, a, uh, which is a, a barrier to effective relationships and love, because fear is counter to love. And so the solutions we've talked about are, you know, spirituality, mindfulness, gratitude, being positive, and, uh, and understanding this. And so now... Now we have to roll up our sleeves and we're going to do this next time and talk, uh, you know, roll up our sleeve about relationships. Now that we know that fear and lack of connection is a major barrier to love. uh, Why don't we explore that next time? What do you think? I'm for it. If you stayed with us, folks, we appreciate it. And perhaps some of you are now really ready to, to hear the next part. And we're, really ready to talk about it ourselves because Danielle and I have both agreed that this exploration of this topic, fear and love and compassion as related to it as a, as a broader view of love. uh, We've learned a lot. I know I have. And, um, and so I look forward to it. So join us next time for part two, which has a slightly different title and Danielle drum roll. Love, it's not at all what you think it is. Whoa, isn't that the truth? Well, okay, we'll see you next time, folks. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Dr. Roger and Friends, The Bright Side of Longevity. If you like the show, please rate and review, and be sure to click to follow.